Yeah, I do remember the idea that we learn best through attraction and not through avoidance. So really the, the key idea is when you discover joy and you extend joy, then it will be very attractive. You will literally attract witnesses to that joy. And it just grows exponentially. And I think you're getting a glimpse of that from your time here at the monastery. There's, there's an underlying joy. It's like more, it's like a volcano of joy. You can see it even in the first day of this festival. I, I was telling Lisa, yeah, people, even after the, all the great songs and the artists were on last night, and then they just put the music on to, well, at 10.30, and then there was dancing on the stage, and dancing, dancing, dancing. It's like, it just, it's just a bursting joy. It's just, it, it's a volcano of joy, and it just keeps drawing forth witnesses, and that's how it works. It's all through attraction. A lot of you know I like to watch movies, and 1929, Jimmy Stewart, Lionel Barrymore, you can't take it with you. It blew my hair off, to knock my <laughs> socks off. That, and what the movie's all about is about happiness and joy. Lionel Barrymore plays Grandpa, and he's got this house, and everybody is intuitively following their joy in Grandpa's house. In fact, that's the only rule, the only guideline in Grandpa's house is that everybody follows their joy. So. One is trying to type a screenplay out. One's a dancer. One's a xylophone player. One's a guy who likes to invent fireworks and in the basement. And there's always these big explosions going off because this guy's in the basement uh, inventing fireworks. Everybody is happy. And why are they so happy is like it's Grandpa's house. And you know what? Grandpa is happy. This guy, Lionel Barrymore. In this movie, you can't take it with you. He's playing, he's like our Holy Spirit character. And he's so loving that ultimately, even when the forces of the world, of supply and demand, of trying to, to uh, Jimmy Stewart's father is a businessman, kind of a Wall Street kind of tycoon, trying to take over, buy property, he bought everybody's uh, house in the whole area to make a giant... Uh, factory or a giant business except Grandpa. Grandpa wouldn't sell. No matter what the price was, Grandpa wasn't selling his house because he had everything. It was, you can't try to bribe contentment. You can't bribe happiness. Happiness laughs at bribes because bribes have no meaning to happiness. And Grandpa is content. So, so in the end, even when the neighbors get fearful, even when Jimmy Stewart gets fearful and his fiance gets fearful, in the end, the final scene of the movie is Lionel Barrymore, Grandpa, sits down and plays the harmonica with the, the character that's tried its best to play the ego, you know, to play the forces of the ego. And they finally sit down at the end and everything is healed. All wounds are healed, all grievances are healed, as they all sit down and they all are dancing. The final scene of the movie before it fades away is this giant dance scene where everybody is dancing and these two guys are playing the harmonica. It's a great, great symbol of the power of love, of the power of joy, the power of that happiness and harmony. There is no force in the universe, in the cosmos, in all the galaxies that can that can limit love, that can limit that happiness. There is nothing that can take your fun away. If you are determined to have fun, there is nothing that can take your fun away. You have the power to laugh at everything. And that's how the world will end. The world will end in laughter. When, you, when your laughter grows so strong inside of you that there's no force that can come against your laughter, then, then you've reached the state of heaven. It's an invulnerable state. It's a state of joy. It's a state of happiness. There's nothing that can come against it. What I also liked about You Can't Take It With You, this 1929 movie, is it really wasn't spiritual in a conscious way or, or religious at all. There was one reference, and it kind of reminded me of me in my life, because I go around like the Pied Piper going, yeah, 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 come on, join me, join me, join me. And I do have quite a few people that do that come and join in, but Grandpa goes to this uh, business and there's one guy that, he's, he's very unhappy at this job that he's got, 
And basically, Grandpa comes right up to him and just cuts to the chase. He says, why are you here? And then he gets right into, where is your, what's your fun? Where is your fun? And making little creatures, little rabbits and little furry creatures, mechanical creatures is where the fun is. He brings it out, and as soon as he shows these little fun creatures at work, everybody at work gathers around him, and, and all, they all get into the joy immediately. Grandpa just shows up to ask one question, why are you here, where is your joy? And as soon as the guy responds, then everything in his whole life turns around. The only thing Grandpa mentions is to be like the lilies of the field. That's, that's a slight reference to Jesus' teaching in the Gospels. You know, look at the lilies of the field, they neither spin nor toil. You know, and look how they're clothed, even greater than Solomon. That's the slightest little reference, but as he's leaving and his boss is screaming at him, don't come back, if you leave here, you never come back to work. You are fired, you know, you are out of here if you leave. He leaves, he says, I'm a lily, and he goes and he squeezes <laughs> in the, the elevator with Grandpa just to get out of there in time and get in there with Grandpa, and he goes to live with Grandpa, and, and that's how he makes his break. That's what true spiritual community is about. It's not a substitute dependency. It's not like you're trying to leave the city to come out to the desert. It's not like you're trying to leave a worldly life of complexity to come out to a life here. If you're not having fun out here, you, the ego complexity will show up out here. You know, it'll, it'll show up everywhere because the mind is so powerful, it projects the world. And if you believe in complexity, you will find witnesses of complexity wherever you seem to go. They just, like sticky paper, they, you know, it, it's just going to hang with you. I want to be happy and joyful. Ah, it's, just, it's, it's still complex, complex, complex. But if you get into this simplistic vibe of trust, where you see that, okay, I may meet a lot of people, I may seem to travel to places and this and this, but if I stay in the joy of my heart, then I'm going to want to just keep giving and extending this joy, and I'm not going to have expectations that the world do something for me. I always say this line, if you want something from the world, the world will seem to want something from you. That's when you, you have people that come that are trying to repossess something, that are trying to get something from you, market something to you, sell something to you. That's one thing I like living out here in the, among the rocks. They don't have anything to sell. They never are like soliciting, you know. You never have a rock come to your door and... Like one of those uh, telemarketer calls. The rocks do not make telemarketing calls. Hello? Hi there, you've, you've been selected to, to receive this one-time special offer for 1995. There's never been a rock that offered me a 1995 deal. They just don't. They don't call. They're peaceful. Does that look like contentment? You know, there are changes. If you were here and you did time-lapse photography, maybe every year or so you might see something fall. I haven't seen anything really fall. It's just, there's just this contentment. And, and that's what you want. If you don't want anything from the world, the world won't want anything from you. I have people that write to me and invite me to come places, but it's their invitations, they're not demands. They're not saying, you know, you come to this city or else we'll, we'll put a horse head in your bed or something, you know, <laughs> we'll make you a deal you can't refuse. They're invitations. But invitations, I find, are fun, because what can you do with an invitation? You can accept it or let it go. But you, but you can do, you can still follow your joy and your fun. You don't have to, there's no, there's no sense of demand, there's no sense of obligation. I don't feel any sense of duty. When people write me email questions, and I've answered thousands and thousands of email questions, but I can honestly tell you, that I have never once answered an email question out of obligation or duty. Absolutely not. If I want to go have a fudge sickle instead, I'm going to go have a fudge sickle or a popsicle. I am not answering that email. Oh, I'm dying, I'm on my deathbed, please help me, I'm ready to commit suicide. Nope, a red popsicle's coming in right now. I'm sorry, no people thoughts. 
That suicide request will have to wait until, until what? Until I have the Spirit inspires me to write or say something. But you see how that's, there's not obligation and duty. If you're in the joy, you can go and fully have that, you can lick that red popsicle, every little tongue stroke, you're going to enjoy that thing. And that's more important than wars and suicide and diseases and everything. In that moment, if that's your guidance, then enjoy that popsicle. Think of Grandpa and It's a Wonderful Life. His joy, his happiness. He wasn't living for the future. He wasn't living for an outcome. He wasn't living to try to, he wasn't trying to fix the world. He was just encouraging everybody to get into their inspiration. And that's the kind of life you want, actually. You would rather be an inspirer than a consumer, than a contributor to the gross national product of what? Of a country that doesn't even exist. You know, this is a construct. Krishnamurti talked about this, nationalism. These are all just constructs. Oh, I'm a citizen of this country or that country. You know, I mean, when I first went to Argentina, uh, I remember I was, I was down there and I think some event happened in the world. I think the United States started bombing Baghdad or whatever, and they had effigies, these effigies of George Bush burning in the streets. This is in the middle of my, I'm doing like a 14-day tour down through Buenos Aires and different cities down there. One day, you can walk in the streets. The next day, they're jam-packed with protests, with burning effigies of Bush. And I remember, I told this story parable many times, but I remember going to the group, uh, the A Course in Miracles group. Before this, they were asking me about sickness, death, relationships, discernment and everything. As soon as the bombs drop on Baghdad and the protests fill the streets, then the very first question is, what is your view of your president? What kind of question is that? What is the view of your president? Really, I mean seriously, what, what kind of question is that? So they had to translate the question to me into, in, from Spanish to English, and I'm listening and I'm like, so that's the question, what is the view of your president? I said, I have no president. That was my answer. I was very short and to the point, I have no president. So they had to translate it back to the Spanish. The woman's like shaking her head, and she's like saying, don't you understand the question? So that's the next one that comes. This is the first question of the gathering. And I said, my answer is no. I don't. I don't understand it. I said, let's, let's be honest. We're all children of God. We all were created in love. We really have always been this love, and we, we really aren't these concepts of human beings and having presidents and having countries. The idea of spirit having a country. The best thing about the Olympics is all the, I love the parades and the pageantry and everybody marching together and all the flags and that's the whole thing. I mean, on the opening ceremony, that's, that's my miracle experience. I just like to see all the people and all the colors and all the different things. I enjoy the pageantry because it's a celebration of our oneness and everything. But when the competition begins, it's like, what does that have to do with anything, really? C competing? You know, to be the, what, the best athlete, the best, the best body at doing this thing or that thing. You know, I've definitely got no people thoughts when it comes to the Olympics. I'm just enjoying all the, the fireworks and the happiness and everything, but once the games begin, uh, the games have ended for me. Uh, I'm not interested in who wins and who loses. Those are just constructs again. There's nothing loving about competition, because it's all based on duality. You've got to have two to have competition. Oneness doesn't compete with itself. Or sometimes athletes will say, well, I'm not competing against anybody else, I'm competing to get the best performance for myself. I'm competing against myself. That's just as crazy as competing against other people. <laughs> competing against yourself. What kind of self is that that competes, you know? It's not a very loving idea. So when you get into that, you start to see the world in very, with very different eyes, and you just lose interest in the things that seem to once seem important. But then, after a while, they're just not fun. I'm saying, not fun at all. And when, when things are not fun, what do you do? You drop them. And it's very simple. It's a very simple approach to happiness.